Okay, guys. Good afternoon. I am Manolo Garabini. Just a second. Okay. Uh, so, I am Manolo Carabini, I am a PhD uh, from the University of Pisa. Uh, I work in the group uh, led by the professor Antonio Bicchi. <coughs> and uh, we as lab are part of the NMMI, so the Natural, Natural Machine Motion Initiative, to uh, let's say, foster the diffusion of uh, the soft robotics in general and uh, soft actuators, soft ends, variable stiffness actuators, and so on and so forth. Um, so in these uh, two hours and in, in the uh, next two hours, we will see uh, together uh, basic, uh, <coughs> first in theory, and then uh, we will try to apply what we uh, are going to see in theory on the uh, VSA cubes. Algorithms for uh, solving the motion control problem. Okay? Soft robotics is uh, becoming more, more and more popular, so uh, not just uh, in the University of Pisa or uh, inside the consortium of the project Safari, but also uh, literally worldwide in Korea, in Japan, and there are uh, several laboratories that are uh, really uh, interested in this technology and that are uh, developing hardware solutions. Um, of course, more are the labs that are interested in the technology, but <coughs> that have not the resources, uh, both in terms of time uh, and, and money, to develop their, their own hardware. Uh, but uh, can be interested in applications, control algorithms, uh, and so on and so forth. So now that the, uh, that the technology is, uh, is there, um, which are the, the two main problems? So what are we going to do with this new capability of change uh, the impedance, the stiffness of our robots? Okay, so from this point of view, for this problem, um, in the literature you can find two uh, ways, two solutions. One is the teleimpedance approach in which uh, we basically let the humans do and then understand from the human's behavior how to control the impedance and the stiffness of the soft robots. From another point of view, uh, another way to understand what to do with the impedance, to understand the full potential of this, of this new technology, is to start from optimality principles. And then, <clears throat> uh, with the help of the uh, optimal control theory, uh, derive uh, optimized solution for designing, so for choosing the stiffness in general, the impedance of our uh, soft robots, and uh, for uh, controlling the stiffness or the impedance during the tasks. Uh, for example, from this point of view, we studied in the past several tasks like uh, the maximization of the uh, speed, um, minimization of the energy consumption uh, of elastic systems, for example, in uh, cyclic motions, uh, if one chooses the optimal stiffness of the system, can minimize the energy consumption along the motion, or, sorry, or uh, one can do also even more if can uh, change the stiffness during, during the task. But, uh, let's start from the beginning. So uh, let's see 
let's look at the motion control problem. Uh, we need, first of all, to do with this new technology what we are able to do with the classical uh, stiff, rigid robot. So, uh, if you want to move a soft manipulator from the point A to the point B, uh, which kind of algorithm are we, are we going to use? Uh, and from, uh, let's say, uh, a point of view of, of a lazy student, that is what I was, uh, are the old classical algorithms developed for rigid robot uh, still usable, still useful? Uh, so, first of all, let's have a look at the uh, problem of controlling the motion of a rigid robot, and then uh, after that, we will see uh, and if and under which hypothesis uh, the classical control algorithms are uh, useful for controlling uh, soft robots, variable stiffness actuators, and then we will see also practical uh, experimental tests and practical applications. In the classical uh, motor control problem, motion control problem, the uh, task, task specifications are usually given in the uh, operational space. So basically, usually what are we, uh, what we want to do is to uh, tell to the manipulator, so uh, bring the end effector in that X, Y, Z uh, position possibly also with the orientation. And, but uh, uh, we don't want in person to specify the, uh, each single joint position, okay? On the other side, the contractions are usually performed in the joint space. So what usually we can do is, apply, is to apply torque at the joint level. So for solving this problem, two are the, the control schemes, the general control schemes that we can, can apply, the classical, let's say, control schemes, the joint space control, and the operational space control. So as regards the uh, joint space control problem, uh, here, the task can be subdivided into sub-problems. So one is uh, the inverse kinematics. So basically, uh, we need to derive from the um, operational space desired trajectory or desired uh, pose, the joint space desired trajectory or desired posture. <clears throat> There are several algorithms for solving this problem, of course. Less or more robust, less or more, or more fast. And after that, once we have the uh, joint space desired trajectory, we need to uh, design a control algorithm for tracking this uh, uh, joint space desired uh, trajectory. So, the drawback of this, uh, of this approach is that the operational variables, so basically the um, end effector posture, if we think to a manipulator, is controlled in an open loop fashion. Uh, that means that any uncertainties in the structure, in the model, so basically you can think to the uh, backlash of the gearboxes to the elasticity in, in the links or in the joint that is not modeled to uh, other uh, unmodeled effect uh, dynamics or not dynamics, we uh, are gonna to uh, influence the performance at the operational state level. On the other side, there is the uh, um, 
The control can be performed in the operational space. So, in a, in, <coughs> in a way, the inverse kinematic problem is embedded in the feedback control loop. And conceptually, uh, this approach allows to directly control uh, the variables in the operational space. Conceptually, why? Because often, uh, very often, indeed, the measurements of the variables at the operational space are not possible. So, in the great majority of the cases, what we can do is to measure the joint uh, variables and then through direct kinematics or other, other ways, uh, go back to the uh, operational state variables. Okay, so in this way, um, basically the direct control uh, in the operational space is uh, from a theoretical point of view. If one has direct, a direct measurement of the uh, operational space variable, in that case the, the <coughs> control allows uh, actually to, to act on the operational space. So uh, now we will see the uh, rigid manipulator model, then um, basically three uh, algorithms for solving the joint space control problem, and then uh, three approaches for the operational space control problem. After we will see, uh, we will speak about the uh, model of uh, a soft manipulator, and then we will see which are the hypotheses for uh, <coughs> under which we can use uh, the algorithms that we uh, that work for uh, the control of rigid manipulators, also in the soft robotics context, and then we will do experimental tests. So here it is the uh, the model of. Um, I mean, conventional model of a rigid manipulator. Um, as you can see, with B, uh, it is represented the inertia matrix that depends on the configuration of the robot. With C, uh, the uh, Coriolis matrix. F with V, it represents the, uh, <coughs> the damping of the system. And G, the, the gravitational uh, generalized Force forces, and tau represent the vector represents the vector of the generalized forces at the joint level that uh, can be performed by the actuators. In this framework, the uh, control problems is stated as the uh, <coughs> evaluation of the. Uh, and components of the generalized forces that uh, allows a, an execution of the motion at the joint level. So basically we have a desired trajectory, QD of T, where T represents the time, and we want that the actual trajectories, the actual joint trajectories, uh, follows the desired one. So now let's go a little bit uh, inside the model and uh, let's see uh, which, uh, I mean, how uh, is the way <coughs> in which the uh, actuators are conventionally modeled. Okay, here we, we uh, can see again the components of the model of the manipulator side dynamics. Then let's go uh, a little bit inside the, the actuators. Uh, in the great majority of the actuators, there is a uh, um, reduction. I mean, we can think to several uh, different, very different, also in principle and in the mechanical implementation ways to. Uh, uh, realize a gearbox. Conventionally, a gearbox is modeled with a gain matrix, okay, that allows to pass from the um, 
joint variable, joint position variables, let's say Q, to the uh, Q with M that in this, uh, in this framework represent, represents the vector of the uh, motor position variable of the motor positions before the gearbox, okay? In this model, the gearbox is considered to be uh, rigid and without backlash. Of course, an anal uh, the same relations, relationship can be applied to the uh, actuation torque. So basically, the uh, actua <coughs> actuation driving torques are the um, uh, link side torques multiplied by the inverse matrix of the uh, that represent the gear the <coughs> reduction ratio of the gearboxes. Okay. Then we have the driving systems. Um, in this case, we have the model of the uh, of an electrical uh, electric motor, and um, for these devices, of course, the uh, torques, the motor torques are um, proportional to the uh, armature currents through the uh, the torque constants. Now to go, uh, in order to go uh, deeper inside into the model, we have to split two different ways. We have to consider two different ways to control uh, the motor, so the driving side of our, of our system, the voltage control or the current control. In the voltage control, basically, um, the idea is to control the armature voltages of the motors through uh, control voltages and of course an uh, amplifier gains, okay? So then we have this relationship between the armature voltages of the motor and the armature currents and the velocity uh, of the motor side, okay? Through the armature resistance and the uh, velocity to voltage constant. So basically, as you can see from these three relationship, uh, putting them together, we can pass from the uh, actuation torques to our actual control uh, input, that is the, uh, the control voltage. And we can recast everything in the uh, complete model of the uh, rigid manipulator, okay, in which that has exactly the same uh, shape of the uh, first equation we, we saw at the, at the beginning of the presentation. But in this equation, as we can see, uh, the uh, matrix uh, that multiplies the link velocity is not uh, anymore just the uh, damping of the system, but it takes uh, into account also the effect of the motor dynamics. And uh, the control input is basically the uh, control voltage multiplied by uh, a suitable, uh, a suitable matrix gain. From this relationship, we can uh, derive how the uh, actuation torques are generated in the voltage control uh, in the voltage control scheme. So basically. Um, the torques that indeed uh, act on the manipulator are generated by the uh, control voltage 
plus or, or minus in this case, of course, uh, an additional terms that depends on the, uh, on the link velocities. So, if these three hypotheses hold, basically, the elements of the, uh, of the matrix gain that represents the gearboxes are much larger than one, that means uh, that uh, a large reduction is present in our system. Uh, the elements of the, um, of the uh, matrix gain that, uh, um, that multiplies the uh, current in the voltage current relationship are much smaller than one, that is, that is quite usual for uh, electric motors. And above all, the required values of the torques are small enough. Required values for what? The required values for tracking our trajectory in the joint space. So if these three hypotheses hold, then it means that uh, <coughs> this difference is, uh, I mean, the, the torques are, are as we as we said, very small, so basically this difference is almost, almost zero, and then we can consider that the um, control voltage is proportional to the uh, speed of the, of the links of the, of the manipulator. Then in this case, the velocity depends just on the uh, control voltage, and each joint can be controlled independently, uh, independently of the other's joint. Uh, then it means that the position control scheme can be designed according to a decentralized uh, control structure. So to to wrap up, in this case, and just in this case, in which these uh, hypotheses are true, I mean, in an engineering sense, let's say true, uh, one is in some sense uh, allowed to do, to go for uh, the decentralized control structure. Okay, so for, uh, from a control point of view, treating the system as a um, sum, in some sense, of uh, single input, single output systems. Okay? Uh, sorry. If uh, the three hypotheses that we uh, saw uh, before are not true, then that means that basically the torques that are required for uh, tracking a desired trajectory are not small. Uh, we have to consider that the torques depends on the dynamics of all uh, of the all uh, manipulator, and above all on the complete state of the manipulator. That means that the torque of the joint E depends on the all uh, position and velocity variables of the uh, overall manipulator. So in this case, one should go for a uh, centralized control scheme. In the second case, one uh, approach that can be useful in order to uh, let uh, the control variable be um, a little bit less dependent on the overall on the parameters of the overall model is to go for the current control. So basically, this in this approach, the uh, uh, voltage control 
is uh, basically proportional to the current and then directly through the, to the torque of the, of the manipulator. So in this case, uh, with, with this uh, low level control fashion of the uh, electric motor, we have that the torque are directly, and so the control input of the manipulator is directly uh, the, the uh, actual control we can, we can use. Okay, so uh, now uh, first we will see some uh, algorithms for controlling the, uh, the manipulator in the joint space. And uh, so uh, we will see both the centralized and, and centralized control algorithm. So the decentralized control idea is that uh, the manipulator can be regarded as, uh, uh, let's say, sum of uh, n, if n is, is the dimension of the uh, Q vector, of n subsystems that can be modeled as uh, a linear subsystem, as you can see here, so a system that has uh, an inertia and a damping, okay? And the nonlinear couplings, the nonlinear coupling effects between the overall joint are taken into account through uh, this disturbance. So basically, uh, the torque is uh, the input that we have. This is the model of the system that we are taking into consideration. Now we uh, are going to see <coughs> exactly the passages to derive uh, this model. And uh, the nonlinear and the coupling, let's say, effects of the manipulator are all inside this term D that is treated as a disturbance. So basically what are we going to do is to uh, cancel or uh, reduce uh, as much as we can the effects of the disturbance of the, uh, on, the, uh, on the tracking error to improve as much as we can the tracking performances of, of our control algorithm. Of course, a great advantage of this control approach is uh, the simplicity. Uh, not only in terms of algorithm, but also in practical terms. So basically, this way, uh, if we uh, are uh, indeed able to, to design a controller uh, that is independent for each joint, we need <clears throat> a controller that elaborates just one measurement, or if we do, for example, just position feedback, just one measurement for one measurement for each joint. Okay. If we, uh, for example, think to uh, the centralized to the centralized control algorithm, we need a controller that uh, performs calculation on the overall state of the manipulator online. Okay, so that is the, the real strength of this, of this control approach. So now let's see how, how actually it is possible to derive the equations of the linear system plus the disturbance. And here uh, we have the model of the of the manipulator uh, without the, uh, the electric part, since we, we saw that uh, at the end we can derive uh, an equation that <coughs> brings the model in the same, uh, in the same way that this, uh, that this one. 
the difference is that this time the equation is, the model is written in the, uh, at the motor side, let's say. So basically we have the motor side variables Q with them and tau with them. And it appears the, the matrix gain of the gearboxes. So the idea is to uh, split the inertia matrix into, uh, into terms, one that is constant and uh, uh, actually it's diagonal also, and um, consider all the nonlinearities, so basically all the terms uh, that are depending on the configuration of the robots, in this uh, delta B of Q uh, matrix. Basically, this way we can uh, write uh, this equation in which, since this matrix is diagonal and also this matrix is considered diagonal, uh, we have N uh, decoupled uh, linear systems. And this is the equations, the equation that basically gives us the uh, value of the disturbance. And as you can see, it includes all the nonlinear terms that uh, appear in the manipulator model. The nonlinear parts of the matrix inertia, of the <coughs> inertia matrix, the Coriolis matrix, and the, the gravity vector. Okay, so now that we have, uh, let's say, somehow stated the problem more clearly, more uh, clearly, we can see the first very basic and, let's see, totally the e easiest uh, control approach that we can use. And uh, so here we can see the uh, linear model of uh, an electric motor in which these two terms, K with M and T with M, depends on, of course, its dynamical parameters. And as we can see here, it has uh, just a <coughs> pole at the origin and a real pole at minus one over Tm, T with M. Here there is the disturbance, <clears throat> and here there is the controller, okay? Of course, our goals are good trajectory tracking and good disturbance rejection. Then, what we need in the control, and that is the reason why the control has this uh, fashion, is the presence of an integral action, so basically uh, a pole at the origin, uh, why? In order to uh, cancel the effect of a constant disturbance. For example, let's think to the gravity. And, of course, we need an eye gain before the disturbance in order to, uh, in order to reduce the effect of, uh, of the disturbance on the tracking, on the tracking performances. So, uh, in the slide before, we, we saw the idea, and uh, in practice, in order to, uh, to improve the, dyna the, performance, <coughs> the dynamic performance of the controller, what, uh, what one uh, can do is close uh, several feedback loops around the disturbance. For example, in this uh, case, that is, let's say, the, the complete one, there is the, uh, the outer loop is the position control, feed, is the position feedback loop, okay? This C with P represents the uh, position controller, and this K uh, with TP represents the constant of the transducer that, uh, of the sensor, let's say, that read the position. 
the joint position. And then, after this loop, it, uh, what it is generated is the uh, velocity reference that is, again, uh, um, putting feedback with the actual velocity of the, of the manipulator. And there is another feedback uh, on, the, on the accelerations. These uh, control algorithms, this control uh, approach, of course, requires the uh, measurements not only of the positions of the manipulator, but also of, the, of its velocities and accelerations. After we will see that uh, there is a way in which uh, um, this control scheme can be translated into, uh, into what it, it is called PADD. PIDD scheme uh, that requires just a position feedback. So basically just a measurement of the position. The drawback is that the uh, selection of the coefficients is uh, a little bit harder, but uh, the great advantage is that we, uh, that control algorithm doesn't require the derivation of the velocity and the, the acceleration of the system. Okay, so uh, let's go back to the position feedback scheme. In this scheme, um, here uh, we are the uh, transfer functions of the uh, direct, the feed forward path and the uh, end of the return path, okay? Uh, What's the goal of this, of this analysis? Is to um, choose this TP and KP, so basically the coefficients of the, of the controller. Here, of course, we are in the, in the linear system field, so uh, we can use all the tools that are uh, that have been well developed in the during the years in the control uh, theory of the linear systems, for example, the uh, stability analysis can be performed through uh, uh, the root locus analysis of the system. For example, it's interesting to see what happens. Uh, to the root locus of the system, if we consider uh, T with P uh, smaller than T with M. Uh, what does it mean? What, what are basically these two, two variables? T with P is the uh, position of the uh, zero of the controller, and T with M, uh, um, as you of course remember, is the position of the, of the real pole of the, of the system, of the plant. So basically, if we are in this condition, the system is unstable. So uh, no matter, uh, we can choose whatever gain we want, but there is no way to bring back the poles in the, uh, <clears throat> in the, stable, in the stable region. Okay, so. Uh, T with B has to be larger than T with M. This is a condition that has to be guaranteed in order to have a stable, a stable system. What happens is if T with P increases, uh, basically the real part of the <coughs> of the uh, two poles here increases. And if we take T with P much larger than T with M, the root locus changes uh, this way. 
So basically, as we can see, one of these two, uh, one of the branches that starts from uh, this <coughs> pole is goes here and then to the zero, and the other one with the other with the other uh, pole that is the real pole of the system goes uh, to the two asymptotes. Uh, of course, if we are in this situation, what we, what we gain is that the dynamic response of the system is much faster because, uh, of course, we have the poles that are uh, at higher frequencies if we uh, are in the, <coughs> in the conditions we saw in the slides before. before. Then, uh, in order to select the, the feedback gain of the controller, if we look at the disturbance output transfer function, it is written here, we can see that the gain of the controller KC here is, um, I mean, the, the transfer function uh, um, changes this way, so if Kc is, uh, uh, is larger, is, uh, these two terms are, uh, are decreased. So basically, this indicates that uh, as Kp increases, the effect of the disturbance on the overall uh, performance of the system are decreased. Uh, actually, in uh, practical applications, it's uh, not advisable to increase Kp uh, than a certain, uh, a certain value because in case of systems with small damping, uh, with small damping ration, it will lead, uh, I mean, in theory, the system is uh, still stable, but it will lead to a system that uh, will show um, and acceptable oscillations in the transient. Uh, okay, so basically, to sum up the ideas uh, of this control approach, um, the first, the easiest, the centralized, the centralized control algorithm uh, is. Uh, PI, con PI position feedback that can be, uh, of course, improved uh, uh, by doing PID or PIDD position feedback. And uh, for the selection of the uh, coefficients of the controller, uh, for the simplest case, uh, we, uh, let's say the, the direction, the advices are the feedback gain as large as we can if we have high damped system, not too large if we have not so high damped system, and uh, uh, the um, the real zero of the controller <coughs> has to be uh, a time constant much larger than the time constant of the of the real pole of the system that we are going to control. Of course, in case we have a um, desired trajectory with large velocities and large accelerations, uh, no matter how we uh, tune our controller, but the tracking performances will be degraded, of course. Uh, so, um, an approach that can be used to improve uh, the tracking performance in this, in this, uh, in this case is to add a, a feed-forward uh, decentralized compensation. This way, the controller uh, uh, still is decentralized, so basically, uh, the controller has to process just uh, the measurement of uh, the joint it has to control. Uh, 
and the adoption of uh, feed-forward action based on the desired velocity and the desired acceleration and or uh, improves the uh, the feedback the, the tracking trajectory of the of the system. Uh, notice that in order to evaluate uh, the uh, derivative of the desired position and of the, the <coughs> and the second derivative, so the acceleration, uh, once the desired trajectory is known analytically, it is straightforward. Okay. Sorry, and what is S? What is the S variable in the first block? This. Yeah, what is S? I completely lost it. I don't know where it came from. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, it is Laplace transform. So basically, this scheme represents the uh, scheme of the linear system in the Laplace domain, so in the frequency domain. So basically you have to consider to pass from the time domain, from the time equation to the, uh, to the Laplace equation in which the uh, variable that is uh, usually used is S. That is the reason why you can see S in all these, all these schemes. Okay, so it's, it is pretty common in the control literature. Um, okay, going back to the evaluation of the derivatives of the time derivatives of the uh, desired trajectory. Uh, once the desired trajectory is known analytically, of course, the derivation of the velocity and the acceleration is straightforward. Even if it is not the case, uh, these evaluations can be performed offline. Okay, so basically, in any case, uh, it is not uh, an heavy computation that uh, has to be done online by the controller. Of course, perfect tracking is impossible. Okay. And uh, in this framework could be obtained just if uh, the uh, feed forward action will match, will <laughs> exactly match, and the model, of course, will exactly match the, uh, the model of the, of the plant. Uh, so basically, all the control approaches that uh, we have so that we saw and <coughs> that we will see also uh, can achieve a good tracking, but of course not a perfect tracking. Um, even if someone in theory could allow to reach perfect tracking. So here, um, as I anticipated before, you can see how the, uh, the scheme can be conducted, uh, the control scheme can be conducted, reconducted into a scheme that uh, requires just uh, position feedback. Okay, here you can see the equivalent scheme that, uh, uh <clears throat> so this scheme basically is equivalent to the scheme with position and velocity feedback. Okay, and this one uh, is the equivalent scheme to uh, the scheme with position, velocity, and acceleration feedback. Okay, um, one thing to be noticed is, is this one. So basically here, uh, as you can see, uh, it appears um, a zero at the origin. Okay, so actually this cannot uh, be implemented. What we can uh, implement is something that has uh, a zero near the origin and then a very high frequency pole. Okay, 
that is, let's say, a good approximation of, of uh, a zero at the origin. Still, in theory, we can write controllers like this. As I anticipated before, the advantage of this technique is that uh, it requires position measurement only. <clears throat> the, the disadvantage is that the uh, uh, selection of the feedback gains is, uh, let's say, a little bit more tricky than in, than in the case if you have explicit uh, feedback of velocity and, and acceleration. Okay. So now, um, from now on, basically, we are going to see algorithms, algorithms that are more and more uh, going towards the centralized control. Okay. In this algorithm, what we are what, what is the aim, what is the goal, is to uh, uh, evaluate in advance the effects of the, of the disturbance and to compensate for them. But as we, as we saw before, the effect of the disturbance, basically the disturbance itself, depends on the overall state of the manipulator. So basically, what is, what is the, the idea of this approach? We can use a feedforward action that depends on the overall uh, state of the manipulator, but not on the actual state. But, uh, <clears throat> actually, it depends on the desired trajectory. So desired trajectory, desired velocities, and desired accelerations, and of course, the dynamic model of the manipulator, but not on the actual state. So basically, the controller, if, if with the word controller we think to, to the thing that has to uh, perform calculations online on the actual state, remains decentralized. But now, in the approach, we are going to see that the uh, feed-forward action will depend on the overall, overall state of the system. Overall, let's say, quantities of the system. So let's start with the definition of uh, the tracking error. <clears throat> Here we have the output of the uh, PIDD regulator. According basically to this scheme, okay, and then this equation summarizes the dynamics of the uh, of the system with the uh, output of the uh, PIDD controller, the feed forward, the centralized action. So that depends on the desired acceleration, the desired velocity, the disturbance that acts on the system, and the, syst the plant dynamics, of course, linear plant dynamics. Okay, we, if we uh, basically redefine the coefficients, uh, we can rewrite the dynamics, uh, the dynamics of the system this way. Basically, what we have now is a, a second-order dynamics uh, of the error, and uh, the input of this dynamics is the uh, disturbance. So as we can see, um, any trajectory 
can be any feasible trajectory to be to be exact can be asymptotically tracked if the disturbance is uh, is zero. And the presence of a disturbance, of course, causes a tracking error. The tracking error can be reduced can be reduced by the adoption of large enough gains in the controller, uh, provided that these large enough gains are feasible, <coughs> and uh, and so on and so forth. So here, uh, there is the idea of the feed-forward computed torque. Uh, we can use the, um, since we know the, uh, we are assuming that we know the model of the manipulator, we can use the model of the manipulator in order to evaluate the uh, disturbance at the, uh, at the desired uh, the disturbance that we have if the <coughs> if the, mo the the plant is exactly tracking the desired trajectory so basically as you can see here uh, we have the qd qd dot and q <coughs> qd double dot in principle the introduction of a feed forward action that uh, aims to compensate the, for the disturbance uh, uh, should lighten the effort of the controller uh, in order to track the desired trajectory. Here we have the, the scheme of the, of the controller of the feed-forward computer torque approach. Uh, with the decentralized controller, the decentralized feed-forward action, and the uh, centralized field-forward action. That uh, basically evaluates the disturbance at the desired trajectory. Um, also, in this case, it, is, it has to be noticed that the, um, the, what, what we call the residual disturbance, that is basically the difference between the disturbance evaluated at the desired trajectory and the actual disturbance that acts on the system. So this difference vanishes if uh, we are doing perfect tracking and if the model is exactly known. So, in this case, so with, under these two very actually strong hypotheses, what we evaluate here is exactly what acts on the system, and then uh, the feed forward action will cancel the disturbance action. This, this is just because this is the most general controller we can, we can think we can use. Actually, uh, we can use... You already have the information. Like using the centralized forward approach, you have already the information that you get from the Basically, what, what you are doing with this part is exploit as much as you can the knowledge of the model you, you have, basically. But the knowledge of the model will not be ever perfect. So uh, th this feed-forward action actually, as I was telling, will, compens will exactly compensate for the disturbance action if and only if you have, not only the knowledge is perfect, but also the tracking is perfect because The disturbance depends on the model, but also on the state. Okay, so if you are in a state that is not exactly the desired state, 
actually not, not only the state, but also the acceleration of the system. If they are not exactly the one that you, uh, that you have in the desired trajectory, basically there is a mismatch between the feed-forward action and the true disturbance action. So that, that's why you, need sti you still need feedback. And uh, of course, you can use just the centralized feed-forward action and the feedback controller. But uh, the decentralized feed-forward action still improves the performance of the feedback controller. So in general, you can use both of them, not just one. Okay, so the algorithms, the algorithms that we saw so far are uh, all decentralized control algorithms. Even if we have seen also a centralized uh, feed-forward action, the control uh, acts just, the controller uh, evaluates just uh, the state of, of one joint. And that's it. So now we are going to see a centralized control algorithm. Basically, as we, we saw at the beginning of the presentation, when the torques are, are large, or in the case we have direct drive, that is basically, this goes against one of the three hypotheses we saw, the hypothesis of uh, large gains in this matrix, that is basically large reduction ratio, uh, it is advisable uh, to go for centralized control algorithm. The idea is uh, that it's better to eliminate the causes that, um, let's say, are provoking the issues and then the tracking errors, in this case, then to reduce the effects, the effects of the disturbances. The al these algorithms are based on the uh, knowledge of the model, of the dynamic model of the manipulator, of course. Uh, one issue is that so far, we saw algorithms and we saw approaches that uh, can be treated, as I told, in the uh, control theory of linear systems. From now on, we are going uh, to see approaches that has to be uh, treated with the uh, nonlinear, with the control theory of nonlinear systems. Uh, this basically means that. For example, for the uh, uh, stability, we are going to, to go for the, if, if we want to see, for example, global asymptotic stability of one system, we are going to see <coughs> directly upon of arguments uh, and, and so on. And this, as, as I told you, is, is what uh, is different in a centralized control algorithm. Uh, and it is not the case in the, in the decentralized control. So the problem is, given a constant joint equilibrium posture, that we call Q with D, the goal is to find the control structure which ensures global asymptotic stability for, uh, for a given posture. Okay? Oops. And then we are going to see what, uh, what can be done for the, for the motion control for the rigid manipulator through the uh, Lyapunov direct method. So the idea uh, is to use, uh, is to compensate for gravity, okay, for the, the action of the gravity on the manipulator and add a uh, PD, PD regulation term. 
Again, we define the error between the uh, desired posture and the actual posture of the manipulator. Uh, notice that we are talking about pose posture, so not uh, trajectory in, uh, let's say, a continuous sense. So the desired velocity is zero. So what are we doing is point to point motion. We can use also uh, these algorithms in order to do, <coughs> of course, practically, practically also in order to do tracking, but theoretically what are we gonna do is something like this. So uh, we are uh, going to follow point after point the trajectory with zero velocity, with zero desired velocity, okay? So let's choose um, a classical quadratic Lyapunov uh, candidate. In this case, uh, the candidate is um, composed by two terms, basically. One is, um, one depends on the uh, inertia matrix of the manipulator at can be related to the uh, kinetic energy of the, of the system. And this term is uh, uh, basically uh, artificially added. It, is, it has no, actually it has no relationship with the manipulator model. It is just a term that depends on the error tilde, and uh, on this k with p matrix that is uh, just a symmetric positive definite matrix. Okay, we need positive definite definiteness of this matrix in order to ensure the uh, positive defi definite definiteness of the uh, Lyapunov candidate. Of course, this function is positive for all q dot and q tilde. <coughs> Uh, for all non-zero q dot and q tilde. If we evaluate the time derivative of q, uh, we have uh, this equation. Mm, basically, what we have to notice is that here, for example, uh, it is... Uh, it does not appear uh, q tilde dot because uh, it will be q desired dot minus q dot. Since q desired dot is zero, basically here we, it is possible to, to substitute minus q, q dot. And here we have the, the two terms that appear uh, when we derive uh, with respect to time this term. So basically the term with the acceleration and the term in which we have to derive with respect to time, the inertia matrix. <coughs> that is, uh, oops. That is not constant with respect to time since it depends on the configuration of the manipulator. So, okay, now, by recalling the model of the manipulator, we can substitute the term, uh, oops, in the V dot equation, we can substitute the B times uh, Q double dot term uh, with this part of the manipulator equation. And then we can uh, uh, take advantage of this relationship that is, uh, a basic relationship of the uh, dynamics of the manipulators that <coughs> basically depends on the skew-symmetric properties of this matrix. Um, I'm sorry I cannot go deeper into the details of these things, but there is also, I mean, there is a lot to do and, and uh, uh, these are 
basically basic things uh, about the dynamics of, of uh, manipulators of Lagrangian systems. So you can find uh, <coughs> all the proofs of this uh, fact uh, in uh, a basic book of, of dynamics. Okay, so taking advantage of this relation and by, uh, substituting b times q double dot in the expression of v dot, we have this equation, this expression. And basically, as we can see here, there is a, a term that is uh, always negative. And now we can use uh, the control variable, the input variable, in order to uh, make negative definite, is, if it's possible, uh, the V dot. A suitable choice uh, for, uh, for the control law is this, for example. And basically, what are we going to do? We are going to cancel these two terms and to make this part also uh, negative in order to make the V dot negative definite. The overall expression of the V dot is this one. And um, as you can see here, we added a velocity related action that is not strictly required, basically, because we have already F here, the matrix F, that is the damping matrix of the manipulator, that is, uh, by <coughs> assumption, neg uh, positive definite. So uh, what is the, the function of K with D is uh, to uh, improve the damping performances of the system. Okay, if this damping is too low, uh, or not large enough, or we can have a better performance with our actuators, we can simply add this term to the, to the control action. That is not, again, strictly required for the stability, but improves the, the stability performance of the system. Okay, so now we are uh, at the point in which we have the uh, V dot that is negative semi-definite, okay? Negative semi-definite, why? Because once Q dot is zero for every Q, uh, the V dot is zero. So the ne negative definite, uh, uh, definiteness requires that the v, uh, a function is zero uh, <coughs> only uh, when all its variables are zero. So basically here, this function, as you remember, uh, depends not just on Q dot, but also on Q. So we need to see what happens uh, when Q dot uh, is zero. If we look at the uh, system dynamics, and we substitute the control action into the system dynamics here. Okay. And we consider that we are at the equilibrium. So basically, Q double dot is zero, Q dot is zero. And so all these three terms are gone. We will remain with the gravitational term and the control input. that basically cancels the gravitational, uh, the gravitational term. So the dynamics of the system with this control law at the equilibrium becomes this. That can be uh, verified if and only if Q tilde is zero. So basically, if the actual uh, uh, position of the uh, positions of the manipulator are exactly the, the desired ones. Again, 
we are happy we have a centralized control algorithm that uh, can uh, theoretically allows for perfect point-to-point -point tracking <coughs> uh, but let's see at the control action so we need to to know uh, not the overall um, dynamics of the manipulator, but we, we need to, to have perfect knowledge of the gravitational term, okay, of the gravity vector. Why? Because if we don't have uh, perfect knowledge of G here, we don't have the, the, same, uh, the same equation, but basically we will have an error between the true uh, the actual uh, gravitational term of the dynamics of the model and and the, the estimated one at that point. In that condition, uh, the same result cannot be cannot be guaranteed. Okay, so we will have to move to uh, uh, other control algorithms like robust control uh, or or things like like that. Anyway, in the hypothesis that the uh, gravitational part of the model is perfectly known, <coughs> known. this uh, control uh, ensures global uh, asymptotic stability for every uh, equilibrium position of the manipulator. Okay? And uh, basically with this, I think, okay, yeah. With this, we um, ended with the centralized control algorithms. And uh, so, now <coughs> we, uh, we'll see um, operational space control algorithms. So, uh, just to, to wrap up a little bit. Till this point, basically we solved the problem in which we have the desired trajectory at the joint level. We saw uh, three big different control uh, schemes in order to uh, track a desired trajectory at joint level. Decentralized control, uh, pure feedback decentralized control. Decentralized control with a feedback and a feedforward decentralized action. Uh, decentralized control with a uh, feedforward, uh, with a <coughs> computed torque feedforward action and uh, one of the algorithms for, the, uh, for centralized control, the uh, PD with uh, <coughs> gravity compensation. Okay, so now we will move to the uh, operational space control problem. In this case, the problem is uh, a little bit different, and uh, the goal is not to asymptotically track a trajectory in the joint space, but in the operational space. So basically, we want that the, uh, actually the, some cases, positions, uh, the position of the, and the factor reaches a uh, desired, desired pose. And that this uh, error, again, tends uh, asymptotically to, to zero. For the operational space control, two are the uh, main schemes that can be applied. The Jacobian inverse control and the Jacobian transpose control. Uh, 
so this, these two schemes are, are um, let's say, different in, in practice, different in the implementation, but they, um, we can see at them uh, as different de declination of the same uh, basic idea. In the Jacobian inverse control, uh, the operational space error, so X tilde, is transformed into <coughs> into a, a joint space error, okay, then is, uh, the joint space error is multiplied by a uh, suitable uh, gain matrix, and what we uh, will generate are uh, generalized force and torques, of course, at the joint level. In the Jacobian transpose control, uh, what happens is that the operational space error is first multiplied by a, a matrix gain, and then after that. So basically, what does it mean? It means that we are multiplying a difference. Let's think at this error as a position error. We are multiplying a deflection, a deformation, uh, times a gain. So basically what we are, we are having is like a force in the operational space, a generalized force in the operational space. Then, <clears throat> through the uh, transpose of the Jacobian of the manipulator, we transform this force into this generalized force at the operational space into generalized force, forces at the uh, joint space. Of course, in the first case, in the first scheme, we have to use the inverse of the Jacobian to, in order to translate the operational space error into <coughs> joint space error. And of course, uh, this is valid if the quantities are small enough, okay? Because what we are doing here is inverse kinematics, okay? And actually, uh, this relationship comes from the uh, differential inverse kinematics that is valid at the, uh, <coughs> at the difference of the uh, positions, even only if the quantities are small enough, okay? And then we multiply the errors at the joint level for a uh, suitable uh, matrix gain, and we have, at this level, we have the uh, uh, general, generalized forces at the joint level. Okay, here as you can see there is uh, this block in which it appears this k, k function. If uh, we have directly the measurement of the uh, quantities at the operational space level, basically we can think to this uh, like if it was the identity. In the other case, if we, uh, as, as uh, in the case of the drawing, if we have a <coughs> the measurements of the quantities at the joint level, this K block performs the direct kinematics of the, of the system. Okay? Here we have the uh, Jacobian transpose control scheme. And the difference is that uh, first we generate the forces at the operational space level, then we, in some sense, project the forces from the operational space level to the joint, to the joint uh, space, and then at this level, as in the, the other approach, we have the uh, uh, generalized forces at the joints. OK. 
here has, of course, the, the same, the same <coughs> meaning that in the, in the scheme before. OK, so now uh, we have seen these uh, two schemes, like in a, let's say, <coughs> uh, in an easy fashion. So what we are going to see is um, the centralized control approach that we saw for the joint space control, also for the operation, operational space control, uh, and, and its stability. We have already defined uh, what X tilde is, that is, uh, again, the error between the desired pose at the end effector at the operational space level and the uh, actual uh, the actual measurements uh, so let's take again a quadratic Lyapunov function candidate that is very similar to the to the candidate that we uh, considered in the uh, joint space uh, uh, approach and uh, what changes is that now we are considering the x tilde error in place of the q tilde, but basically uh, the meaning is, is the same. We have the same uh, hypothesis. Uh, let's take into consideration the, the derivative of the, uh, of the Lyapunov function. And now, uh, also in this, uh, in this case, at the uh, operational space level, consider, uh, let's consider to, uh, to the point, point, point to point motion, okay? So that means that the desired velocity we want is, uh, is zero. In this case, of course, the uh, derivative, the time derivative of x tilde is uh, reduced of the uh, it is reduced to the time derivative of the uh, of the measurements of the of the <coughs> operational space variables and through the uh, Uh, through the uh, inverse kinematics, we can uh, write this uh, uh, through the direct kinematics. Sorry, we can write this relationship. Okay, so uh, uh, through the Jacobian of the manipulator, and the, uh, we can uh, pass from the operational space velocity to the joint velocity. That means that in this term, we can substitute. Uh, x tilde dot with uh, the Jacobian of the manipulator times q dot. Again, as in the previous case, we have to consider to recall the model of the manipulator and again the properties <coughs> uh, that q dot transpose times b dot minus uh, two times the Coriolis matrix uh, times q dot is equal to zero. And after the substitutions, the uh, expression of v dot appears very similar to the expression of uh, v dot in the, in the joint space case. Okay? So we have the first term that is uh, negative definite because uh, remember that F is the um, damping matrix that is positive definite, so basically this term will be uh, negative definite. And here we have uh, a term that we can compensate, uh, as in the previous case, with, the, with a suitable choice of the control input. So in the operational space case, the control input has to compensate for the gravity, as in the previous case, uh, <coughs> uh, 
compensate for the position error. And also in this case, uh, we had um, um, an action, a further action proportional to, uh, to the velocity in order to, to improve the stability performance of the system. Here we have the expression of, uh, of V dot after uh, we have substituted the uh, uh, control law. And as in the previous case, we can see that this is uh, negative semi-definite. So uh, that means that um, the Lyapunov candidate decreases for any trajectory of the system with Q dot different uh, with Q dot non-zero, basically. So for any trajectory, the system will reach an equilibrium posture. Now, the question is, is this equilibrium posture the posture that we want uh, as uh, uh, desired and effective, as desired operational space pose? Um, in order to determine that, we uh, have to substitute into the dynamics the control action. So we can, uh, okay, here. And consider that we are at the equilibrium. So basically, the dynamics will be the statics of the manipulator, U equal to the gravity term. The control action at the equilibrium will be the gravity term plus the, uh, um, the term proportional to the error. And this will be zero uh, since the velocity at the equilibrium is zero. And the dynamics uh, will assume this uh, form at the equilibrium. Under the assumption of full rank Jacobian, Okay, that is an assumption that <coughs> this is an assumption that in the first case, in the joint space uh, control case, uh, we didn't need. But in this case, we need the assumption that the Jacobian of the manipulator is full rank. Under this assumption, uh, we can ensure that the uh, desired um, operational space pose is. Uh, actually, actually tracked by, by the control law. That is the, the scheme of the operational space uh, PD plus gravity compensation algorithm. Also, in this case, in order to compute U, we need uh, the knowledge, the perfect knowledge of the uh, gravity of the system. And also, in this case, if we have the uh, direct, direct measurements of the operational space quantities, uh, we can think to K as the identity, if in the other, <clears throat> in the other case, we have to perform, we in the sense, the controller has to perform also the, the direct kinematics. Okay. Um, so, for time reasons, I, I limited the exposition, exposition of the uh, control algorithm for, for rigid robot to, to the ones we, we saw in this hour and a half, more or less. Uh, of course, there is a lot more. There is adaptive control, inverse dynamics control, robust control, and so on and so forth. And, uh, these this algorithms can have can work better than the ones we we saw. 
can be uh, more or less suitable for uh, different tasks or, or systems. Uh, but what we are, are really looking, I really want to, <coughs> gonna to see is, uh, okay, this is good for rigid robot. It seems that for rigid robot we can actually do several things. We can do point-to-point -point motion, we can do tracking, <coughs> we can reject disturbances. But for soft robots, and this, are these algorithms suitable also for soft robots? So since uh, basically everything we, we saw has been based on the model of rigid robots, let's have a look on the mo of <coughs> at the model of soft robots. What changes? What is, where is the difference? The difference is here. The difference is that in a soft robot, between the actuation unit, between the driving unit and the link side, there is a spring. <coughs> and actually this, this is the, the, the simplest model we can use for a soft robot in which the coupling between the uh, driving unit and the uh, manipulator uh, and the, the link side dynamics, the manipulator dynamics is uh, happens through a relationship that depends just on the, uh, the positions of the system, of the, of the links, and of the, of the motors. In general, this, this uh, coupling could, be, could depend on, uh, also on the velocities and, and uh, <coughs> could be also time changing and so on and so forth, but let's, let's keep it simple. The second equation we, we see is the uh, driving system side dynamics. This equation we have the uh, inertia of the motor plus gearbox system. Uh, it's damping, of course, the, the action of the spring. And here we have the driving torque, okay? So the difference is that the driving torque here, the, the relationship between the driving torque uh, in, the, in the elastic, uh, in, in the soft robots dynamics, even if the, the spring is, is as a constant stiffness. <laughs> so the relationship between the torques and the uh, um, link side variables is of the fourth order. Also, this system, also if, it, if we think to, uh, let's say, a one joint plus one link system, has four states and one control input and also has two degrees of freedom and one control input. So basically it's underactuated. Okay, so at the first glance it seems that uh, it's, it's hard to uh, apply the control algorithms we saw also for, for these systems. And actually, it is the case. Anyway, there are algorithms for taking into account the overall dynamics of the system. So link side plus motor side dynamics, uh, feedback linearization, and, and other algorithms. But um, in order to apply the, the, the schemes that we have seen, we can uh, assume that the motor dynamics the, motor, the driving <coughs> unit side dynamics is much faster than the link side dynamics. So in other words, we are assuming that we, are, we have as control input the motor position 
that is theta in, this, uh, in these equations, and that this dynamics is uh, much faster than this one, so in other words, that we can generate the torques for having a, a perfect tracking of the position at the motor side, if you want. Then under this assumption, the model becomes this one. Okay, that is uh, that is similar to uh, to the model that we saw for the rigid robots. The only difference still uh, remains here. Uh, assuming that K is uh, is uh, a diagonal matrix, so basically that we have just uh, we have not cross coupling between the motors and the joints, but we have just one actuator on one joint and the, the spring between between them. So, from a mathematical point of view, it means that we are assuming that K is diagonal, and of course, the stiffnesses are positive. So. <coughs> Um, then we can include the uh, k times u term in, a, uh, in an augmented, let's say, gravity vector, and we, uh, we have exactly the same model that we saw for the rigid actuation. Okay, then, uh, from now on, what we can do is Assume that we can control the motor position so that the motor position is our control input variable. We can uh, neglect the motor side dynamics and we can uh, re uh, <coughs> reconduct our problem for series elastic robot to uh, the problem of choosing the motor positions, in this case, in order to track uh, a desired joint or operational space trajectory. Oops, sorry. So now let's complicate a little bit the things and let's see what happens if we take into uh, consideration the model of a variable stiffness actuators like, for example, an antagonistic one that is uh, how the cubes are, are uh, made inside. In this case, we have two, um, for each joint, as you can see here in this, in this uh, scheme, this conceptual scheme, for each joint we have two motors. For each joint we have two motors, and every, motors, uh, every motor acts on, uh, <coughs> on the link. Acts through the springs that in this case are uh, assumed, I mean the, mm, uh, characteristic, the mechanical characteristic of the spring is assumed to depend just on the positions of the motor and, and the link. But in this case, uh, it's not linear. And here we have the dynamics of the, of the two motors. So as you can see in this case, it is not, uh, it is not enough. Uh, the assumption that we can control the positions of the motors. But we need to assume that we can control the position of the motors and also that we have uh, perfect knowledge of the uh, model of the interaction between the motors and the link side. Okay, that, that, that's the difference with respect to the series elastic case. In this case, we need to assume that the uh, motor side dynamics uh, is negligible and that we have uh, perfect knowledge of F1 and F2. Under these assumptions, we can consider 
f1 and f2 as control input variables that we can assign if we want. And in this case, uh, we are again in the same conditions of the uh, rigid manipulator model. Okay? Actually, we can do something more because here we have two control inputs and not just one. So, what we can do is, for example, think to use one control input in order to track a desired trajectory or to do point-to-point uh, -point motion. <clears throat> and the other input, uh, we can think to use the other input for changing a uh, desired quantity of the desired characteristic of the system. Okay. Uh, so what's next? Um, now we are going to see which are the control inputs that we have uh, actually in our hands uh, on these variable stiffness actuators and then some experimental tests on, uh, on the fly. And so I think we can, we can finish here and uh, have the coffee break and then uh, and then restart with this with the with the cubes. Okay. Of course, if you have questions and you want to skip the coffee break, we can stay. Huh? Of course, if you have questions, you are.